Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pelly. Welcome to the special omnibus edition of Journey with Story, where you can listen to all of this month's episodes one after the other. And just so you know, there will be no special intro for the individual stories, no added details and no shout outs. If you want to hear all of those, then you'll need to listen to the individual episodes and not this version. Got it? Oh, mums, dads, grown-ups, you can download some free colouring sheets at our website, www.journeywithstory.com. Let's take an omnibus journey with story. Let's take a journey with the bookery. Timothy Tuttle was a lover of books. He had oodles of them stuffed into every nook and cranny of his itty-bitty house, which was an attic above the bakery. Books, 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 everywhere a book. Timothy Tuttle had books for sunny days and soggy days, for up days and down days. He had books for everyone and anyone, for fusspots and worry warts, for bossy boots and know-it-alls, for dreamers and doers. And in times of trouble, be it a torn teddy, a bent bike or a sick kitty, Timothy Tuttle always turned up with a listening ear, a hearty hug, and just the book to banish the blues and heal the hurt. But whenever he popped into the baker's below to lend a book, Mr Cameron only tisked and tutted and shooed him away. I've no time for books, he grumbled. There's bread to bake and buns to frost. Besides, I've told you before, Mr. Tuttle, you have altogether too many books. You are going to run out of room one of these days. Timothy Tuttle only chuckled. <laughs> no, 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 he insisted. Books are like friends. There will always be room for another. And when one dreadful day, Timothy Tuttle did run out of room for his beloved books, he simply shrugged and said, Oh dear, now I will just have to find some more unusual spots for my books. And that is just what he did. He crammed a bundle into the empty oven. He wedged some in between the stairs. He squirreled a few into socks and slippers and shoes. He buried others in bread baskets and flower pots. He even built a turret of books by the window and a tunnel of books in the hall. And now the only place left for him to read was perched atop a mound of books in the bathtub. But Timothy Tuttle never complained. Instead, he continued to feast on books. Books that moved him to tears, <laughs> to smiles, to do good and to be more. Books, 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 from cellar to ceiling, through hall and bedroom and beyond, books brimmed. Too many books, scolded Mr Cameron as he bumped into a merry band of book lovers bounding down the stairs. Nonsense, called Timothy Tuttle from the landing. Books are like friends. They make you love more. You can never have too many. And indeed, everyone agreed you could not wish for a finer friend than Timothy Tuttle. When little Lucinda Brennan was in the hospital with a spot of tummy trouble, Timothy Tuttle trundled off to give her a wheelbarrow full of books tied up in a ribbon. He stayed a while and read her his favourite book of poems. Oh, you're a pal, trilled Lucinda, and her face sparkled like a star. When Farmer Jim's old cat Alice died, Timothy Tuttle 
bustled off to the fire station with a tuna casserole and a book called Kitty Heaven. He hung around to listen to some Alice stories, and then he left with a wave and a hug. And when Mr Cameron came down with the flu, it was Timothy Tuttle who kept the bakery open. But, 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 but how will you manage? sputtered Mr Cameron. Oh, not to worry, soothed Timothy Tuttle. I've read up all about it. For four days, Timothy Tuttle kneaded the dough, frosted the buns and baked the bread, while customers streamed in and out. Meanwhile, Mr Cameron lay in the back bedroom with a bottle of medicine, a bowl of soup and a bundle of books. Day after day, spoonful by spoonful, the soup and the medicine chased away his fever and his chills. And page after page, word by word, those books of stories buried their way into his heart and charmed him into a book lover with a penchant for pirate stories. On the fifth day, Mr Cameron told Timothy Tuttle, I'm almost better now, but still, can you bring me another bundle of books tomorrow? Ah, certainly, agreed Timothy Tuttle. But before tomorrow dawned, a storm began to brew. In the middle of the night, the rain lashed and the wind screeched. A mighty gust ripped a hole through the roof. Torrents of rain gushed in. My books! cried Timothy Tuttle as he leapt out of bed. They'll be ruined! He called his friend, Fireman Jim. He came at once with his fire brigade. It's going to take a while to mend this roof, yelled Fireman Jim. You need to move your book somewhere safe at once. But, 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 but where? wailed Timothy Tuttle. My bakery, of course. It was Mr Cameron. He had heard all the commotion and had come to help. Oh, splendid, agreed Timothy Tuttle. But how can we move all these books? We could use our special fireman's chute, suggested Fireman Jim. But it turned out the attic staircase was too narrow for the chute and for all those burly firemen. Oh dear, now what shall we do? wailed Mr Cameron. Timothy Tuttle had no answer. He bit his lip. His heart flip-flopped as he thought about a bookless life. As he stared outside and pondered his predicament, he noticed a flock of friends. We've heard about your troubles, they yelled as they hammered on his door. We're here to help. At once, Timothy Tuttle mustered his wits and his manners. In you come, he cried. Now, make a chain, he ordered. A human chain. We can move the books hand to hand. And that is just what they did. Friend by friend, hand to hand, book by book, in stacks and piles and bundles, they moved that attic full of books until they were all lined up next to the bread and the buns, safe and snug and dry. Oh, thank you, my friends, cried Timothy Tuttle amidst a flurry of cheers and tears. Until his roof was mended, Timothy Tuttle stayed with Mr Cameron in the bakery. Then he returned to his attic with a pile of his favourite books, but the rest remained at the bakery. As it turned out, Mr Cameron liked having a bounty of books in his store. It's good for business, he declared. And Timothy Tuttle liked having such a bounty of nooks and crannies to sit and read again. It's good for the soul, he declared. Mr Cameron and Timothy Tuttle hung up a no sign outside. The Bookery now, from far and near, people flocked to buy their bread, borrow a book, and make a friend or two.
books, books, books. Everywhere a book. Let's take a journey with the elephant and the lake. Long ago in India, by the shores of the lake of the moon, there lived a large family of hares. The hares were happy there, for the water in the lake was healing and sacred and protected from the harsh glare of the sun because of the moon's cool gaze. One year, a dreadful drought came over the land. All the rivers and streams and lakes dried up. A herd of elephants who lived a distance away from the lake began to wander day after day in search of water. Their usual watering holes were dry and cracked, and so they plodded for miles and miles in search of water. After a while they grew too weak and feeble from thirst and hunger to continue, and so they sent out a few elephants as scouts to see if they could find water for them. The scouts travelled far and wide, and one day, they came to the Lake of the Moon. The sight of this fresh, full, glistening lake filled them with hope, and they hurried home to tell the rest of their herd about their discovery. When the other elephants heard about the Lake of the Moon, they too were filled with hope, and they said to their king, we must travel to this lake at once. And so they set off as one herd, all travelling together. As they walked, they chanted, We'll bathe again. We'll drink to our heart's content. We'll splash and swim and sip, gurgle and guzzle. And so they trundled off in a great a rumbling herd toward the Lake of the Moon. When the first elephants spotted the lake, they trumpeted, We've made it! Water at last! Then they all began to run toward the lake. Now, as it happened, the hares had appointed some of their number to guard their lake. When the hare guards saw the elephants, hurtling toward the water, they hurried to warn their fellow hares. Quick, quick, run for shelter, they cried. The hares at once began to pick up their young ones and scramble to find safe hiding spots, all the while shouting and squealing in terror. Hurry, move, hide! But alas... The herd of elephants were thirsty and hot and so desperate to reach the water that they continued to charge blindly ahead, not even noticing the hares in their path. They saw only the water and so in their haste they trampled over many of the poor hares. When the elephants reached the lake they plunged in and bathed and drank and swam and spouted water from their trunks. The hares peeked out from their hiding spots. Then they called upon their king and begged for his help. The elephants are going to take over our lake, and we will lose our beloved home. What can we do? Never fear, said the king of the hares. I know exactly what to do. Of course he did, and this is why he was the king. The very next day, the Hare King went to visit the Elephant King. Hello, good sir, said the Hare King. 
My mistress, the moon, has sent me here to see you, and I must give you a warning, a warning for all the elephants. Oh, what is that? asked the curious elephant king. He could not imagine what sort of warning the hare had for him. The moon is angry with you for visiting her lake. She says she will never forgive you if you do this again. If you decide you must come to her lake, she will stop shining down on you and the sun's rays will dry up this lake too. And then there will be no water to be found anywhere. Ha! said the Elephant King. I do not believe you. Come then, said the King of the Hares. And he led the Elephant King to the edge of the lake. Look there, said the Hare King. Look into the lake. What do you see? When the Elephant King looked down, he saw the moon's face staring up at him. She looked solemn indeed. You see that look on her face, said the wise hare. She is plotting her revenge upon your herd. The Elephant King was alarmed. Oh, I am so sorry, Moon, he mumbled. I have no intention of insulting you. And he stuck his trunk into the water, hoping Moon would take hold of it in a gesture of forgiveness. But when the elephant stuck his trunk into the water, the moon disappeared. <gasps> She's gone, he gasped. She will forgive you only if you leave her lake, said the king of the hares. And so the elephant nodded. He raised his trunk out of the water, and there, once more, was moon. I will leave now, said the king of the elephants, and he called his tribe to him. And the herd walked away, and never again did the elephants visit the lake of the moon. And so the family of hares continued to live in great peace and contentment by the shores of the lake of the moon. Now, let's take a journey with The Golden Goose by the Brothers Grimm and adapted a bit by me. Long ago, there once lived a woodcutter and his wife who had three sons. Now, the eldest two sons were big and brawny and their parents were forever praising them to the heavens. But the youngest lad was not so big or brawny, and his parents and brothers were forever making fun of him, and even called him feeble and simple and not a bit of use to anyone. One day, the eldest son wanted to go to the forest to cut wood. The mother praised him for being such a useful boy, and before he set out, she gave him some of her best fruit cake for his lunch and a bottle of cider to wash it down. While the lad was walking through the forest, he met a little old man who said to him, Can I have a bit of your cake and a swig of your cider? Oh, I'm so terribly hungry and thirsty. The eldest son replied, Be off with you, you horrible little man. And so the little man hobbled off into the forest. The next day, the second eldest son went out to the forest to cut wood. Before he set out, his mother praised him for being such a useful boy and gave him an apple pie and a flask of elderberry wine for his lunch. As he was walking through the woods, he came across the same little old man as his brother had. Ah, please, said the little old man, can I have a piece of your pie and a sip of your wine? I am ever so thirsty and hungry. Get away with you, shouted the lad. Why should I share my food with the likes of you? Go and get a job and buy 
tie your own foot, why don't you? And so once more the little old man hobbled off into the woods. On the third day, as the youngest brother set off into the forest to chop wood, his mother and brothers made fun of him. Ha <laughs> ha! Who does he think he is? Why, he won't even be able to chop wood for the life of him. Ah, look how scrawny and feeble he is. And he's so foolish and simple, he will probably lose his way before he even finds the forest. But the poor lad paid them no heed as he packed himself a stale loaf, a little lump of old cheese, a flask of water, and set off for the forest. He had not gone far when he met the same little old man as his brothers had. Oh, I don't suppose you'd share your lunch with me, sighed the little old man. Oh, why not, the lad replied. I don't have much to share, but you're welcome to join me. After all, I would be glad of the company. And so the two of them sat down and ate happily together. When they had finished, the little old man whispered, I am going to tell you a secret. "'because I can tell you have a good heart "'and a kind manner about you. "'There's an oak tree by the river "'near a very large rock. "'Chop it down "'and you will find among the roots "'something very fine.' "'The lad thanked the little old man "'and went off and chopped down that tree. "'And there among the roots "'he spied something bright that sparkled in the sunlight. It was a goose, a goose with feathers made of pure gold. The lad realised that he was in luck and he thought to himself, well, why should I go home now and suffer the insults of my parents and brothers? They will take this valuable bird from me and I shall have nothing. So there and then, the lad decided to run away from home and seek his fortune in the world. He put the golden goose under his arm and set out for the town. That night he stayed at a nearby inn, paying for his room with one of the feathers. But it's not every day that someone steps into an inn and pays for a room with a feather made of pure gold. News of this simple lad with a golden goose spread fast. That night, while the lad slept, the innkeeper's three daughters poked their heads out from the hallway. Each of them hatched a plan to steal that goose. Later that night, the innkeeper's eldest daughter tiptoed into the lad's room. She reached out to grab the sleeping goose with the golden feathers, but the moment her hand touched the goose, it stuck. Try as she might, she could not remove her hand. Oh, I may as well fall asleep, she thought. I just hope that by morning my hand will be free. Then I'll go back to my room before anyone finds out I even came in here. But a little later that same night, the innkeeper's middle daughter slowly opened the door. She too tiptoed into the room, meaning to steal the golden goose. But much to her surprise, snoring in the corner was her big sister. She tapped her big sister on the shoulder to wake her up. Alas, the moment she touched her sister's arm, she too was stuck. And a little later that same night, who should come creep, creep, creeping into that room? Yes, the innkeeper's youngest daughter. When she saw both of her older sisters snoring in the corner, she went over and tapped the arm of her middle sister. Instantly, her fingers were stuck fast. The next morning, they all awakened. The lad yawned and said, Oh, now that was a good night's sleep. It's time to move on. He took the golden goose and left the inn, not paying a bit of attention to the three sisters who were stuck behind him, all 
tripping over each other's feet as he walked along. A farmer, hoeing his field, saw this strange sight. He said, oh, I've never seen a golden ghost before, but if those girls are going to get a piece of it, there's no reason I shouldn't either. And he grabbed the youngest daughter by the hand, whereupon his hand instantly became stuck to her hand, and he had to stagger along behind them. Then, a little further down the road, a miller caught sight of this golden goose with a trail of people behind it, and he too ran forward, thinking he would like a piece of this good fortune for himself. But of course, as soon as he grabbed the farmer's hand, he was stuck fast. Now the five of them trundled on and soon saw two woodcutters coming out of the woods. The farmer, the miller, and the three sisters called to the woodcutters to come and set them loose. But the woodcutters thought they were being motioned to stay away from the golden goose. And of course, that they would not do, for they too wanted to have some piece of this golden goose. And they rushed forward to grab the miller and stuck fast. So, now there were seven of them stuck, trailing the lad and his goose. After a while they entered a kingdom where a large crowd was gathered in front of the king's castle. What's going on? asked the lad to someone in the crowd. They're all trying to make that princess laugh, he said. She hasn't laughed in years, and the king says the first worthy fellow who can make her laugh will marry her. Honestly, father, the lad heard the voice of the princess coming from the balcony. If there's something that's not funny, it's a bunch of silly boys trying to win my heart. Oh, but dear girl, the lad heard the king plead, won't you give the next one a, a teeny weensy chance? Number 542, step up. The princess threw her arms up in despair and whirled around. And as she did, she saw the lad looking around as if nothing at all is the matter, with seven people tripping behind him, all attached to one another. It was hilarious. She laughed and laughed and laughed. The king, however, was none too pleased that this foolish lad, a woodcutter of all things, should marry into the royal family. I said a worthy young man, frowned the king, crossing his arms, a noble man from a good family, not a woodcutter. The lad shrugged. Whether or not I marry the princess, he said, with just a few golden feathers, we'll all eat like royalty, come one and all. At that very moment, all seven followers, who had been tugging and pulling with all their might to break free, suddenly came loose. Springing backward, they collapsed into a heaping pile of arms and elbows and knees and legs and spinning hats. The princess roared with laughter once more. Oh, father, she said, gasping for air from laughter. He will always keep me laughing. Besides, he's the only fellow who ever offered us anything. Everyone else wanted to get something from us. Hmm, that is true, said the king, rubbing his chin. Twice he's made you laugh, and he's a generous fellow, not to mention he has that golden goose. So the woodcutter lad married the princess in a grand wedding, with the little old man sitting up in the front row in his own special seat. And from that day forward, they all lived in great peace and contentment, and every day the sound of laughter rang out from every corner of the palace, from sun up to sundown.
let's take a journey with the ungrateful tiger. A long time ago, high in the mountains, there was once a small Korean village where a fearsome tiger roamed, terrorizing all the people. The attacks became so bad that the villagers were too scared to leave their houses, even in the daytime. The village elders gathered together to work out what to do, because something had to be done. After a night of pondering and pontificating, arguing and quarrelling, they finally came to an agreement. They would set traps for the tiger by digging deep holes all around the perimeter of the village, filling each hole with chunks of red meat and covering them up with branches and leaves. The whole village set to work, each family providing whatever red meat they could spare. Then they waited in their houses, waited for the tiger to come lurking. The next morning, the nephew of the village chief, who had come from the city, arrived on foot. As he approached the village, he heard an almighty roar. Cautiously, he approached and saw at the bottom of the pit a miserable tiger. Oh, please, please help me get out of here. I'm trapped. And I'll die if you don't help me. If you help me, I would be eternally in your debt forever. The young man was confused. You promise you won't eat me? <gasps> promise cross my heart. The young man, who had a kind heart and a loving spirit, took pity on the tiger. Immediately he started to look around for something to help pull the tiger free. He found a long branch sturdy enough for the tiger to grip onto. He lowered it into the pit and the tiger hauled himself up. Then the tiger heaved a deep sigh of relief, licked his lips and simpered. Oh, why, thank you, little snack. You're just in time for tea. But, but, but you said you'd be eternally grateful forever. You promised not to eat me. Oh, everyone knows that you can't trust the promise of a hungry tiger. And tigers are always hungry. Just as he was about to pounce, the young man yelled, Wait! Let's ask that cow over there if you should keep your promise and not eat me. The tiger liked games because it made his kill so much more interesting and so he agreed to ask the cow. <coughs> The glum-looking cow yawned. Oh, man makes me work hard in the field and then when I'm too old to work, they make food and shoes out of me. Tiger, go ahead and eat him. The tiger prepared to attack. Stop, yelled the young man. I think we need a second opinion. Let's ask that, that little rabbit over there. This is your last chance, juicy young man. The young man anxiously explained the situation to the little brown rabbit. The rabbit had a little think and then he said, Before I make my decision, I need to see exactly what happened. When they arrived at the deep pit, the rabbit said, Now show me exactly where you were when this young man passed by. The hungry tiger, impatient for his meal, leapt into the pit. Well, I was in this deep pit and I, I started roaring because I was stuck. I was stuck in this deep, deep pit. Oh, I'm stuck again! 
the tiger began roaring with rage. The little brown rabbit quickly urged the young man to be on his way and to think very carefully before rescuing another hungry, ungrateful tiger. I hope you enjoyed all of our stories for this month. And if you subscribe to our Patreon page, you can enjoy even more perks and resources. Here's to stories aplenty that fill our hearts with grace and goodness, hope and light, so that we remember, as my favourite poet says, All shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Be well, my friends, be well, and join me next time for Journey with Story. Music and post-production was by Colette Jonas.